Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to learn how to create a simple two-player turn-based game that runs on a network. So this is our expected output. We have two players and each player takes turns clicking on a button. Each button has a random number of points assigned to it and at the end of the game, all the points are calculated and whoever has the highest number of points wins the game. So let's begin. All right, so let's start. This is my teaching assistant, Gab. Say hi, Gab. Hi. So he's going to be helping me out. All right, so I have a new um, project here. And then let's go ahead and create a new class. So we'll start off by um, creating the, uh, the J frame for the game. So let's name this one um, player. Let's name this the player class. So you want to make sure you import the javax.swing class in java.awt. So let's give this one um, uh, a couple of properties. But before we do that, let's go ahead and extend JFrame. So this is going to be our JFrame. Okay. So let's give it a few properties. Um, we want to give the width and the height. So those are integers. So private int width and private int height. And then we want to get the content pane, which is a container, so private container content pane. So this is where we'll be placing our components, which are the J text area. So let's call that one message. And then let's go ahead and create four buttons for the game. B1 uh, all the way to B2. So those are the fields we need so far. And then um, let's go ahead and create the constructor. So public player. So this one will accept uh, an integer for the width and an integer for the height as well. So let's go ahead and initialize those fields. So width is going to be equal to W and height is going to be equal to H. And then let's get the content pane. So content pane is equal to this dot get content pane. Then let's create the components. Message is equal to new J text area. And then we create the buttons. So B1 is equal to new J button, and it's just gonna have the label one on it. And then B2, B3, and B4. Okay. So up next, let's go ahead and create a method that um, sets up our GUI. So let's call that one setup GUI, public void setup GUI. So here we want to set the size of the frame, this dot set size, width comma height. And then let's set the title, this dot set title. And then let's just, uh, let's just put in a turn based game. It's going to be the title of our frame. Then this dot set default close operation, jframe dot exit underscore on underscore close. And then let's set the layout of our content pane. Let's give it a grid layout with one row and five columns. So content pane dot set layout, new grid layout one comma five. And then let's go ahead and add the components. So you want to add the uh, you want to add the message text area to the content pane. So go ahead and say content pane dot add message. So that's our text field. And then let's set the text that's going to be displayed in the text field. So put in message dot set text. And then let's just put creating a simple turn based game in Java. Now I want to set the word wrapping for the text field. Otherwise the um, the text is just gonna go in a straight line. So we want to set word wrapping by first calling the set wrap style word method and setting it to true. And then we call message dot set line wrap. And then we set that to true as well. So this activates the word wrapping. And I don't want the message text field to be editable. So just put in message dot set uh, set editable false. And then finally, let's go ahead and add the buttons. Content pane dot add B1 all the way to B4.
So those are our components. And then we want to set the frame visibility to true. So this.set visible true. Okay, so that completes the setup GUI method. So let's go ahead and create our main method. Public static void main string args. So let's instantiate the player. Player P is equal to new player. Let's give it a width of 500 and a height of 100. And then let's call p.setupgui. Okay, so at this point we can go ahead and uh, run it. So right click on the player.java file and choose run file. So, oh, we have an error. Okay, let's see. Where is our error? Oh, we have an extra curly race. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So run file, and if all goes well, we should have our player frame. There it is. Okay. So all right. So in this next part, um, let's go ahead and create the game server class. So let's go ahead and create a new class, new Java class. So let's call this one game server. So we want to import Java.io. Dot asterisk and import java.net dot asterisk okay so our game server is going to need a server socket so put in private server socket let's name it ss and then I want a field for the number of players so let's say private int num players so for this game we'll just make uh, two players okay so let's go ahead and make the constructor public game server okay so let's just put some feedback first uh, let's put a print line statement that just says game server okay just so we have some feedback whenever we instantiate this okay and then let's set the num players to zero because we start out with zero players Next, we create the server socket. So we are going to need a try catch for this one. Okay, so SS is equal to new server socket. And then let's set the port to 51734. So again, the port is an arbitrary number that you choose from. Um, so when the player connects to the server, it has to specify the same port number. Okay, so let's put in the catch clause, catch IO exception. Ex, and then let's just put some feedback whenever the uh, whenever the error is thrown, or the exception rather. So let's just say IO exception from game server constructor. Just so we know that in case the exception does get thrown, we get some feedback as to which part. Okay. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and create a new method. Let's call this one accept connections. So this is going to encapsulate the um, the instructions for um, the server waiting for connections. Okay, so let's put in um, a try catch again. We're going to need a try catch here. So inside the try clause, let's put in some feedback that says system.out.printline waiting for connections. Okay, and then we want to create a while loop. Okay, so the while loop is going to say while num players is less than two. So this while loop allows us to limit the connections to up to two players only. So inside this, we want to say socket s is equal to ss.accept. So this is the line that tells the server to begin accepting connections. Okay. So after that, after a connection is accepted, we want to increment num players by one. Okay. So when the first player connects, it increments num players to one and it waits for the other player to connect. So let's put in some feedback. System.out.println and then we say player number okay, plus num players. So whatever the current value of num players is, and then plus, and then we say has connected. So the first time this runs, it's gonna say player number one has connected. And then the next time it runs, it's going to say 2. Then after that, um, 
the while loop doesn't run anymore because we reached two players. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, after the while loop, let's just put in some feedback that says we now have two players no longer accepting connection. Okay, so this only gets printed out once we actually have two players. And now it's time for the catch clause. So catch IO exception EX. And then we just say system.out.println IO exception from accept connections. Again, just so we know, but if uh, an exception does get thrown, that it's going to, uh, and then it comes from this specific method. All right. So next, let's go ahead and create the main method. Public static void main string args. And then let's instantiate the game server. Game server gs is equal to new game server. And then we say gs.accept connections. Okay. So now we go ahead and edit the player class so that it should be able to connect to the server. So let's go back to the player class. So what I'd like to do here is I want to create an inner class. I'll call it the client side connection. So this one is going to encapsulate the networking instructions for the client. So let's go back up to the fields first. Let's create another field for the client side connection. So I'm going to name the class um, client side connection. So we have to say private client side connection. And then let's name this one CSC. Okay, so we're going to get an error first. That's because we haven't created the class yet. So let's go back down and then let's go ahead and create the inner class. So we say private class client side connection. So again, this is going to be an inner class that encapsulates all the things we need for the player to be able to connect and communicate with the server. So what are the fields we want to have here? So we'd like to have a socket, private socket. Let's just name it socket. But we seem to be getting an error. Why is that? Private socket. Cannot find symbol. Oh, okay. So. What do we need? We need to import java.io and java.net. So we need these classes because we are now putting in the network functionality. And then, as you can see, the error is no longer there. Okay. So up next, we put in the we create the data input stream and data output stream fields. So this is, allows us to actually send and receive the data. Okay. And then let's go ahead and create the constructor, public, client-side connection. So system.out.println, and then it's just going to say client, just so we have some feedback whenever we instantiate the client. And then we need a try-catch because we are going to be creating the socket and the input streams. Okay. So we want to create the socket first. So socket is equal to new socket. And then for the time being, let's just, for the IP address, let's just specify local host because we'll be testing it in our own computers. And then for the port, um, a while ago we chose 51734. So we're going to need to put in the exact same port here. Okay, so this creates the socket. It initiates the connection to the server, which right now is just a local host. And it uses the specific port 51734. So after that, we go ahead and create the input streams and output streams. So data in is equal to new data input stream. And then we pass to it socket.get input stream. And then we do the same thing for data out. Data out is equal to new data output stream, socket.get output stream. Okay, and then we put in the catch clause. So catch IO exception. And then we just say system.out.println IO exception from client side connection constructor. So I'll just put in CSC for short. Okay, so now um, let's go ahead and create.
create a method called connect to server. So this one is going to be a method of the top level class. So let's go back up to our, uh, maybe just at, just below the setup GUI method. Okay, so below the setup GUI method, let's create a new method called connect to server. So public void connect to server. Okay. So all we'll do here is we'll just instantiate the client side connection. So CSC. So if you remember, that's the field that we created for the client side connection. CSC is equal to new client side connection. Okay. So if you go back up, if you go back up to the fields, so that's the, can you highlight that? Okay, client side connection. Okay. So now let's go to the main method. Okay. So we want to call the connect to server method. So I want to actually do that before setup GUI. So I'd like to connect to the server first. So p dot connect to server. So the reason why I'm doing that here is um, eventually um, the server will be sending me my player number. So am I player one or am I player number two? So I want to get that before I set up the GUI because the GUI is actually going to contain that information. It's going to say in the title bar which player I am. So this is why I want to connect to the server first. Okay, so, um, all right, so let's go ahead and save that. And let's go ahead and um, test our program at this point. So we want to run the game server first, okay? So right click on the game server, and then let's run the server, run file. So, all right, so it says game server waiting for connections. And then let's go ahead and run one instance of the player. So run file. Okay, so this is our first player. Okay, now if you go to, um, if you go back to the server's um, output window, you should see that it says player one has connected. So let's go ahead and um, run another player. So this is the second player trying to connect. All right, so that's our player number two. And then let's go back to the server output window. So now it says player two has connected, and then it says we now have two players no longer accepting connections. All right, right so what are we gonna do now? So let's go back to the game server. So what I wanna do here is I would like to create runnable objects for each of the players. Since our server is accepting two players, we're gonna need one thread for each player. So what I'll do here is I'll create an inner class inside game server which implements runnable okay so let's create an inner class called server side connection so private class server side connection so this one is going to implement runnable okay let's go back up first and in the top level class let's add a couple more fields Okay, so just below the private int num players. So I want to make two fields here. So they're going to be the server side connection runnables. Okay, so I just put private server side connection player one and private server side connection player two. So we'll create one runnable for each player and these fields allow us to identify which one is for player one and which one is for player two. Okay, so let's go back to the private class server side connection inner class. And then what fields do we need here? So we need the socket, so private socket, socket with a lowercase, and then we need the input streams. And then let's create an integer called player ID. So this allows us to internally within the server side connection inner class, this allows us to internally differentiate between um, whether you are the server side connection for player one or the server side connection for player two. Okay, so let's go ahead and create the, um, the constructor. So public server side connection. Now I want this to be able to accept two objects. The first one is a socket, socket S. And then the second one is an integer, which is going to be for the ID, whether it's one or two, okay? So um, socket is going to be equal to S. 
and then clear ID is going to be equal to ID. So whatever um, gets sent to the server-side connection will then be assigned to these fields. Okay, and then let's go ahead and um, add a try catch for the creation of the input streams. Okay, so data in is equal to data input stream, and then you pass to it socket dot get input stream. And data out is equal to new data out stream socket dot get output stream. And then in the catch clause, okay, catch IO exception, we just say system dot out dot print line IO exception from SSC constructor. So that's it for the constructor for now. So if you want to implement a runnable, we are going to have to override the run method. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a run method. So public void run. Okay. So what we want to put here would be the instructions that we actually want to run on a new thread. Okay, so the first thing I'd like the server to do is I'd like for the server to be able to send the player number. Okay, so in the try clause, okay. We put in data out dot write int and then we pass to it the player ID value. Okay, so this is going to be either one or two. Okay, so once the player connects, the server immediately sends the player what ID number uh, they have, whether it's one or two. Okay, and then you put uh, data out dot flush. Okay, then after this, I want to put a while loop first. So let's put in a um, a while loop while true and then let's leave it blank okay so um, later on we'll put stuff in there that allows the server to send and receive more stuff okay so um, after that let's put in the catch clause okay so catch IO exception ex okay. system dot out dot print line IO exception from run in SSC. Okay. And then a semicolon. So okay. So next. So up next we go back up to the accept connections method in the top level game server class. Okay. So um after it accepts a connection, okay, we go ahead and create a new server-side connection. So just below the print statement that says player number, num players has connected. So we go ahead and create a new server-side connection. So we say server-side connection, SSC is equal to new server-side connection. And then we pass to it S. So S is the socket, right? So um, the server-side connection is going to need a socket. So once we get the socket, we pass it to the server-side connection so the server-side connection can make use of it to get the input and output streams. And then we want to pass num players. Okay? So the first time a player connects, num players is going to be equal to 1, right? Because we begin with num players being equal to 0. And then after ss.accept, we increment num players by one. Okay, so the first time that happens, num players will be one. So the very first player that connects will get a player ID of one. Then after that, the second player connects, num players plus plus is going to give us two. So the second player is going to have um, a player ID of two instead. Okay, so after that, um, if you remember, we created um, two new fields, okay, player one and player two. So these are both server side connections. So we want to go ahead and assign the correct server side connection to the correct field. So if num players is equal to one, this means that you are player number one. So we want to assign um, the SSC to the player one field. Okay? Otherwise, if you're player number two, 
um, we go ahead and say player number two is equal to SSC. So we are simply assigning the correct server-side connection runnable to the correct field. Okay. <clears throat> and then after that, we can go ahead and create the threads. Okay. So thread T is equal to new thread. And then we pass to it the server-side connection. So whatever is in the server-side connections run method will run in a new thread. And then let's go ahead and start the thread, t.start. Okay, so that's it for the game server. Now we go back to the player and we edit that class so that we are going to be able to accept the player number whether we are player one or player number two. So, okay, in the fields area, let's add two new fields, private int player ID and private int other player, okay? So that's gonna be the player ID of your enemy, okay? So where do we set that, okay? So first, we want to go back to the client side connection constructor. Okay. So if you um, so let's take a look at um the try class in there, the one that says socket is equal to new socket. So socket is equal to new socket localhost five one seven three four. So this is the line that initiates the connection request to the server. Once the connection is granted, we get the input stream and the output stream, okay? And we know from the previous code we added that the first thing the server does is it sends us an integer. So in the server, we have a data out dot write it. So where is that again? There, in the run method, we have data out dot write it player ID. So if we have a write in the server, we need to have a read on the player, okay? So right after that line, okay, we go ahead and say player ID is equal to data in dot read int. So here we are able to receive whatever integer gets sent to us. So it's only just either one or two. Okay. So let's put in some feedback. Okay. Let's say system dot out dot print line, and then we put connected to server as player number. Okay. And then we say plus player ID in the period. Okay. And then semicolon. All right. So once we get that player ID, okay, we can now use it in the setup GUI method so that we can place on the title bar what player number we are. Okay. So in the set title method, so let's just change it to player number in quotations, okay? And then plus player ID. Oh, and then um, let's make sure we close the quotation mark right after player number. Okay, so now the title of the frame, the title bar is gonna say either player number one or player number two. Okay, and then um, let's go ahead and set the player ID of the other player. Okay, so inside the setup GUI, okay, so um, just before set visible is equal to true, okay, so I want to put in an if statement here. So if player ID is equal to one, okay, I want to put in a message in the message JTEX area. So we say message.setText, you are player number one, you go first. Okay. And then if you're player number one, it follows that other player is equal to two. Okay. And then in the else clause, so this means if you are player number two, message.setText, you are player number two, period, wait for your turn. And then it follows that the other player is going to be player number one. OK, 
Okay, so at this point, I think we can test our program. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and run the server first. Okay, and then let's, um, oh, did we run it? Oh, we, did, we forgot to close the other processes. So let's close the other processes first. And then there's another one here. Okay. And another one. <laughs> Okay, so let's run the game server. Okay, so we need for connections, and then let's run an instance of the player class. So it comes out there, and then as you can see, it says player number one on the title bar, and says the, you are player number one. You go first. So let's run the second instance of the player. So now it says player number two. Your play number two, wait for your turn. So, um, so, okay, so let's go back to the game server class. So our game is a turn-based game, and each button gives us um, some points, okay? So we want to be able to determine those points randomly, okay? So we'll handle that um, here in the, in the next part, okay? So let's add a couple of fields to the game server class okay so private int turns made so this allows the server to keep track of how many turns have been made okay and then let's create another value another field called max turns private int max turns so this allows us to set how many turns we should have overall for the entire game so we'll just set it later to four okay and then let's create an array of integers called values. Okay. So this is going to um, contain the points for each button. Okay. So we'll randomly generate that. Okay. So inside the server constructor, okay. So um, let's put in uh, num players is equal to zero, and then turns made is equal to zero. Uh, max turns is equal to 4 and then values is equal to new int and then 4 so um, for max turns so um, I'm just making it so that there's a total number of 4 turns for the game so you can increase that if you'd like but it has to be an even number because both players have to have an equal number of turns and then for the values I'm setting the size of the array to 4 because I have four buttons, okay? So if you want to have more buttons, then you'll need um, more values so that each button will have a corresponding value. So up next, let's go and create a for loop that is going to randomly generate a number for each of the buttons, okay? So for int i is equal to zero, as long as i is less than values.length, which is for i++, plus plus, okay? So <clears throat> we want to generate a random number. So to generate a random number, type in math dot random. And then you want to multiply it by a uh, number. So let's say uh, math dot random times 100. Okay. So this is going to give us a number that's anywhere between 0 all the way to less than 100. So the maximum number we can get here is something like 99.99999, okay? So we want to get an integer. So what we do here is we round it up. So round, uh, sorry, wrap this entire statement inside math.seal. Okay. So this always rounds it up, okay? So if we get a 0 point something, it's going to round it up to 1. If we get a 99 point something, it's going to round it up to 100, okay? So this statement here generates a random number that's anywhere from 1 to 100, okay? And then we want to cast it as an integer because math.seal returns a double. So put in um, parentheses int and then a space. So this ensures that um, it converts it into an integer so that we can then assign it to the values array. So values brackets i is equal to okay, the random number. So 
the loop is going to happen in this case four times. So value zero is going to get a random number, values one is going to get another random number, and so on. Okay, so let's go ahead and print out the value. So let's just say system.out.println, and then we just say um, value number, and then we just say um, i plus one in quotations. So this is because um, i starts at zero. So I just want to say value number one is equal to and then we go ahead and print values i. So just so we have some feedback as to what the random values are. Okay, so this should allow us to generate the random values which will serve as the points for each button. Okay, and then let's go to the run method of the server side connection class. So we want to be able to send out those values as well. Okay. So after we write out the clear ID, okay, so um, just before the flush, okay, we say data out dot write int max turns. So this is so that the players are also going to know how many turns they should have. Okay, so data out dot write int values zero. So here we're now sending the values for each button. Okay, so we want to send value 0 all the way up to values 3. 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, and then we do a flush. Okay, so now we go to the player class and we edit the player class so that it can now accept these values. So let's go back up to the fields. So what are the new fields that we'll be adding? Let's create an array as well, private int, square brackets, and then values, and then private int max turns, private int turns made, and then let's set, um, let's create two fields for your points and the enemy's points. So let's name that private int my points, and then the other one is going to be enemy points. Okay, so in the player constructor, so let's go ahead and create the actual array. So let's type in values is equal to new int four, right? Because we have four values and four buttons. And turns made, we instantiate or initialize that to zero rather. And my points and enemy points will be zero as well. Okay. And then we go ahead and accept the values that are going to be sent over the network. So here inside, okay, the server side, uh, the client side connection rather. Okay, so after we receive the um, player ID, okay, so let's go ahead and receive the max turns first, because that's the first thing that we added that's going to be written out by the server. So max turns is equal to data in dot read int divided by two. So why am I dividing it by two? So on my game server. Um, our max turns is four. So what I mean for this is to indicate the total number of turns for everyone. So we divided it by two because player number one is going to have two turns and player number two is going to have two turns for a total of four turns. Okay. So after we get the max turns number, we go ahead and, uh, and get the values for the array. So values zero is equal to data in dot read int. So we do that all the way until values three. So this allows the server, sorry, this allows the player rather to receive the random number values generated by the server. Okay, so we need the server to generate that because we need both players to have the same set of random numbers. Otherwise, uh, the game is not going to be fair, right? So they have to get the same array. Because we could have generated the random numbers here inside the player class, but if we do that here, then each player is uh, more than likely going to have a different set of points for their buttons. So this is why you want to generate it from the server. Okay, so let's see, what else do we need? I think that's it. Um, let's just put some feedback, okay? So on the player side, we want to print out the values that we've just received. So max turns, okay? So whatever the value here, so we should, our expected output is two. 
And then uh, let's go ahead and print out the values for the buttons. Okay, so value number one is plus values zero. Okay, and then we go ahead and do the same thing for value number two, number three, and number four. All right, so I think we're done. So let's go ahead and, well, we're done for this part, okay? So let's go ahead and um, close our running processes first. Okay, and then let's run the server first. So we get these random values, 83, 5, 1, and 14. So each of our players should be getting the same values as well. So let's run the first instance of the player. So 83, 5, 1, and 14, and a max turns of 2, right? So let's run the second instance, so it should get the same values also. All right, so now let's go ahead and begin setting up the, the buttons. So uh, we need to import a couple of things. We need to import one more thing. We just need to import um, java.awt.event because we are going to be creating an event this year. So event is lowercase. Java.awt.event.asterisk. Okay. So let us create a method. Okay. So this is going to be a top level method in the player class. So um, you can just put it right after uh, connect to server. So public void setup buttons. So we'll create um, the code here that sets up the button. So for the action listener, I want to create an anonymous class. So let's just put in action listener al is equal to new action listener. Okay. And then um, we create the action performed method. So public void action performed action event ae. Okay. So what do we want to happen here? Whenever you click on a button, okay, you want to be able to identify which button you've clicked. So this is why, um, so what we're going to do here is we are going to make use of the labels. So the buttons have their labels, right? One, two, three, and four, okay? So first thing we'll do is we are going to get the source of the click. So J button B is equal to J button space AE dot get source. So this allows us to get whatever button was clicked, whether it was button number one, button number two, button number three, or four. Now, each of those buttons have a label. Okay, we can access that label by saying b dot get text. Okay, so let's type that in first. Uh, b dot get text, and then um, this is a string, so it's going to be either one, two, three, and four because those are our labels. So depending on which button it was, so we want to parse this as an integer. Okay, so integer dot parse int. B dot get. Um, and then later on, we'll be sending that integer to the server so that the server knows what button we clicked, okay? And then let's just put that in a uh, variable, okay? So just say int bnum to signify which button number it is, okay? And then um, let's just put in um, a message in the JTEXT area, okay? So let's say message dot set text. You clicked button number plus bnum plus. Now wait for player number plus other player. So if you're player number one, it'll say you click button number, whatever button you click. Now wait for player number two and vice versa. Okay, And then we want to increment uh, turns made. So turns made plus plus. So this is because every time you click on a button, that qualifies as a turn. So you want to increment the number of turns that you've made. So let's put in some feedback that allows us to just see the value of that. Turns made plus turns made. Okay. And then whenever we click a button, 
we want to increment our points, right? The number of points that we have. So we have a field that keeps track of our score. So that's my points. So we want to say my points plus equals the value of the specific button that we clicked, right? So if it's button number one, you want to get values brackets zero in array, in the, in the values array, okay? So we can use bnum for that. We just say bnum, but we say bnum minus one, right? Because bnum is going to be either one, two, three, or four. And the values in the array, the indices are going to be zero, one, two, or three. So we just subtract it by one, okay? And then let's go ahead and print the value. So system.out.print9, my points, okay, plus my points, okay? So for now, let's leave the button functionality at that, okay? We'll go ahead and um, fix the maximum number of turns. We'll go ahead and get the enemy points later on, okay? Now, um, our action listener is an anonymous function or an anonymous class, so we need to uh, end this statement with a semicolon. There. Then after that, um, let's go ahead and add the action listeners for each button. So b1 dot add action listener al, then b2 dot add action listener al, and so on. Okay, so in the main method, let's go ahead and write in p.setupbuttons um, after setup GUI. So we want to put p.setupbuttons. Okay, so I think uh, we can test this now. So make sure that your processes have been um, terminated. Let's run the game server again. Okay, and then let's run an instance of the player number one. And then let's run an instance of player number two. Okay, so let's go ahead and click on any button in player number one first. Okay, so now uh, player number one says uh, you click button number two, now wait for player number two. So if you go to player number two and let's click on, let's say, button number four, it should say you click button number four, now wait for player number one. Yeah, and then if you look at the consoles, um, if you look at the um, output window for player number one, okay, so you should see that. Uh, number of turns made is now 1, and then my point is 60 because you clicked on button number 2. And then if you look at the output window for um, player number 2, so turns made is equal to 1 as well, and my point is equal to 42 because you clicked on button number 4. Okay, so let's go ahead and click on one, let's go ahead and click on um, the buttons one more time. There. So player number 1, so let's click on uh, button number 1. Okay. Then player number two, let's click on another button. Okay, anyone, any any buttons there? Okay, so as you can see, uh, if we look at um, turns made, it increments correctly, and the number of points that you have are being added correctly. So at this point, we don't have a limit to the turns made yet. So I can actually keep clicking here. So we'll go ahead and fix that uh, in a bit, okay? So whenever we run a player, if you're player number one, your buttons should be enabled right away. But if you're player number two, then your button should be disabled, okay? So that um, you actually don't get to run first, okay? So let's fix that here. So let's go back to the player class and then let's create a new field called buttons enabled. This one is going to be a Boolean. So what we want to do here is, okay, so let's go back to the setup GUI method, and then we have the if-else chain in there, okay? So if you are player number one, then we want to set buttons enabled to be true. If you are player number two, you want to set buttons enabled to be false. So initially, the very first run you make, uh, but player number one is going to have a value of true for buttons enabled and then player number two is going to have a value of false. 
And then we are going to use this boolean to disable or enable the buttons. So let's create a method for that. So let's create a method in the player class called toggle buttons. Okay. So this will simply call the set enabled method for each button and then just pass to it the value of buttons enabled. So we put in b1 dot set enabled and then we pass to it the value of buttons enabled. Then we do the same thing for all the other buttons. So if buttons enabled is equal to true, so you pass true to them, otherwise you pass false. And then we also want to disable the button after every turn you make. So let's go back up to the setup buttons method and then right after we increment the turns made. So let's go ahead and set buttons enabled to be false. And then we want to call the toggle buttons method. So what happens here is after your turn, your buttons become disabled. Okay, And then um, let's go back up to the setup GUI method. So after the if else chain, we want to call toggle buttons as well. So at this point, if you're player number one, your buttons are going to be enabled. If you're player number two, your buttons are going to be disabled. Okay, so let's close the running processes and then let's test our program. So run the game server first. Okay, and then run player number one. So the button should be enabled and then run player number two. And as you can see, the buttons are now disabled. So now if we click on a button on player number one, it should disable the buttons right away. Okay. So later on, we'll fix it so that it actually toggles. Okay. Enable, disable, and so on. All right. So now let's go ahead and edit the game server so that it can properly accept the button number that each player clicks on. So let's add another field in the game server class. So private int. Let's call this one player one button num. And then let's make another one for player two. Oh, let's just change this to one the actual number one. Okay, so this is going to store the button number that the player just clicked on. Okay, And then what we want to do here is if player number one clicks on button number three, for example, it gets stored inside player one button num, which then gets sent to the other player. Okay, So we want to do this inside the run method of the server side connection run. So we actually want to place this inside the while loop. Okay? So we want it in the loop because we will be doing this numerous times. Okay? So uh, four times to be exact, because we have uh, four maximum turns, right? So inside the while loop, okay, you want to put in an if statement. If you are player number one, so player ID is equal to one, then you want to read the integer and assign it to player one button num. Okay, so player one button num is equal to data in dot read int. Okay, so you read an integer that's coming from player number one. Okay, so let's just put some feedback. System dot out dot print line player one clicked button number plus player one button num. And then in the else clause, so this is what you do if you are player number two. So if you're player number two, then player two button num is equal to data in dot read int. 
then we put in some feedback system.out.printline player2 clicked button number and player1 okay so now let's go to the player class so we are going to enable the player to actually send the button number. Okay. So in the client side connection inner class, let's create a method called send button num. So this one is going to accept an integer, which is going to be the button number that you clicked on. Okay. And then in a uh, try catch clause, we want to do a data out dot write int. And then we pass to it in, and then we do data out dot flush. And then we create a catch clause. And then our feedback is going to be system dot out dot print line i o exception from send button num. CSC. Okay, so this is the method that actually allows us to send the button number. So we want to call this inside the action listener for the buttons. Okay. So whenever you click on a button, the button number is going to get stored inside bnum. So you just want to make sure that you send uh, bnum. Okay. So our client side connection object is csc right so csc dot send button num and then you just pass to it b num okay so um just as a reminder so if you go back up we have the um private client side connection csc and then um we go ahead and uh instantiate this client side connection using the connect to server method okay and then in the setup buttons inside the action listener, we use CSC to send the number of the button okay, every time we click on the button. So send button number is here. So this is the method that actually has the right ints. Okay? So if we um, test our program now, we should be able to successfully send the button numbers to the game server. So run file. Okay, let's run an instance of player number one. Let's run an instance of player number two. Okay, and then let's look at the output window for the server. Okay, and then let's go ahead and click on the buttons. So if you click on player number one, okay, if you click on button number two, for example, there, player number one, click button number two. Okay. So right now we are unable to actually click on any more buttons because we've disabled the buttons but um, we'll go ahead and uh, fix that uh, later on okay okay so now we want to enable the game server to be able to send the button number to the other player because right now the game server is just accepting the numbers right so let's make the game server be able to send the button number to the other players so inside the server side connection, let's make a method inside there. So um, right at, uh, you can just put that below the run method. So public void, let's call this one send button num. So this one accepts an integer. Okay. So in a try catch uh, statement, so we want to put in a data out dot write int. Then we pass with n and then we say data out dot flush. And then let's put in our catch clause. Okay. IO exception ex system dot out dot print line. IO exception from send button num ssc. Okay. So we want to be able to send player one button num to player two. And you want to be able to send player two button num player three. So this is where our player one and player two server side connection fields come in. So this allows us to properly call the correct send button number method. So what happens here is if you are player number one, you want to call 
send but num from player two. So you say player two dot send button num, and then you want to pass to it player one button num. Okay, and then you do the opposite for player number two. So you want to call send button num for player one, and you want to send it said player two button num. All right, so that's it. And then we go to the player class so that we can actually um, receive those button numbers now. So inside the client side connection, let's go ahead and create another method. So this one is going to be called receive button num. So this one is going to return an integer, public int receive button num. Okay, and then uh, let's create a local variable, int n. So let's just initialize this to negative one. Okay, and then in the try clause, okay, we assign n to be equal to data in dot read int. So this is going to read the integer that was just sent by the server. And then we just say system.out.println player number plus other player plus clicked button number plus n. So we just have some feedback so we can figure out what the other button, what the other player clicked on. And then we put in the catch clause. So IO exception from receive button num CSC. And then we want to make sure we return n. So that'll come outside of the try catch. Okay. So this is why I actually had to initialize n with a number because we are assigning the value of n inside the try clause. So I just had to give it any value, otherwise Java's gonna complain that n may not have been initialized. So I just put in negative one. Um, so later on, you know, if you want, you can use that as some kind of checker for any error. But n should be replaced by um, anywhere between one to four, because those are the button numbers that we will be um, sending out. Okay, so let's test this out first, okay? So in the, um, in the top level class, let's create a method called receive, uh, start receiving button nums. Okay. So in here, we create a new thread. Okay. So we create a new thread in an anonymous runnable object. So thread t is equal to new thread and then you pass to it a new runnable. Okay, so this is going to be an anonymous class. Okay, so, uh, all right. Okay. And then you have to um, write a run method, right? So public void run. Okay, and then inside here, we just have a while loop, okay? While true, then let's just keep receiving the button numbers. So we call the receive button num that we just created. So why am I putting this in a thread? Okay, Because we don't want the, um, the network code to potentially block the GUI code. So we have to make sure that whenever we receive something, we run it in another thread. Because every time you have a read, whether it's a read int or a read UTF or a read boolean, the code blocks. It's not going to run anything else until you actually receive whatever it is that you're waiting for. So it's important to run this in another thread so that it doesn't block any potential GUI updates that you want to make. So what are the GUI updates that we want to make here? Uh, we want to, for instance, update the message field. We want to be able to, for example, um, toggle the buttons. Okay. So let's test this out first, but since we haven't finished the uh, toggle buttons code, let's go ahead and comment those out for the time being. So let's go back up to the setup GUI method. Okay. So let's comment out the call to toggle buttons 
in line 77 here. So let's comment that out. And then um, let's go ahead and comment out the toggle buttons call inside the setup buttons method as well. So I commented those out because I want to be able to test out that I've actually um, correctly implemented the sending and receiving button numbers. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the game server. And then let's go ahead and run player number one. And then let's run player number two. Okay, so let's go to the server output window. Okay, and then let's uh, try clicking on buttons. Let's see. If I click on button number one, okay, player one, click button number one, and then player number two, player number two, click button number two, and then, all right, three, and then, all right, so it seems to be working. And then let's go ahead and take a look at the output windows of the players. Okay. So let's put in some feedback that allows us to actually print out what the other player has clicked on. So let's close our, let's terminate our processes. Okay. Let's see, so where do we put this? Oh, no, the reason we're not seeing the feedback is because we forgot to call the start receiving button nums method. So we made it, but we forgot to call it. So let's call it in name, p dot start receiving button nums. So here, oh, okay, we forgot to do something here. We forgot to start the thread. <laughs> So t dot start. Okay, so now should work. <laughs> okay, there. So now this is the output window for player number two, right? So it showed you that you clicked on button number one. And then here, okay, so um, if we click on um, clear number two, if we click on any button here, it should say, all right. So now we are able to actually send out the button that was clicked by the other player. Okay, so let's bring back the stuff we commented out. Uh, the toggle button, so there's the one inside setup GUI, and then the one inside setup buttons. Okay, so, um, we're now able to receive button numbers, but I don't actually want to constantly receive the button numbers here. What I want is to simply um, go inside waiting mode so that you wait for your turn to get updated when you receive the button numbers. So um, we're actually gonna be removing um, this method. We're still gonna be using um, the receive button num, but we'll be placing it somewhere else, okay? So inside the player class, okay, let's create a new method called update turn, okay? So update turn, is the method that we call whenever we're waiting for a turn, right? So let's say player number one uh, goes first, right? So while player number one hasn't clicked on a button yet, player number two should be in waiting mode, okay? So it's gonna be waiting for the turn to be updated so that it can go ahead and make its turn. So you wanna make your turn once you've received the other player's button up, okay? So inside the update turn method, the first thing we'd like to do is receive the button num, okay? So int n is equal to csc dot receive button num, okay? And then we want to say message dot set text, your enemy clicked button number, and then plus n, and then p 
period, your turn. So once you know what your enemy, uh, once you've received what your, um, uh, once you've received the message that your enemy has clicked on the button, it's now your turn. So we want to go ahead and use that number to update enemy points, okay? So we say enemy points plus equals values n minus one, okay? So if the button, sorry, if the enemy clicked on button number three, so you want to get values two and add that to the points of your enemy. So let's put in some feedback first. So we want to say system.out.println your enemy has plus enemy points and plus points, okay? And then you want to say buttons enabled is equal to true so that you can actually click on buttons and then you want to call the toggle buttons method, okay? So when do we call update turn? Okay, so we want to call it in a couple of places, okay? So let's go back up to um, the constructor. So in the constructor, we've got that, uh, sorry, in the setup GUI. In the setup GUI method, we've got the if else statement, right? So if you are player number two, you want to go inside update turn um, mode right away, right? Because uh, you have to wait immediately for player number one to finish clicking on the button. So here, okay, after we um, set buttons enabled to false, we create a new thread. Okay, so thread t is equal to new thread. And then inside this new runnable, okay, we have our uh, public void run. So this is where you want to call the update turn method. Okay. So what are we missing? We are missing a uh, new run of, oh, here, you have that extra, okay. So what's happening here? Um, we create a new thread that calls the update turn method, and then the update turn method calls um, csc.receiveButtonNum. Okay, so receiveButtonNum is the method that allows us to actually receive the button number that the other player clicked, okay? So this is why we're running it in a new thread, because as I've explained previously, you have to make sure that you run um, your network code, specifically the reads, inside a new thread so that it doesn't block the um, any possible GUI updates, okay? So we actually don't need the um, start receiving button nums method now. So we can go ahead and remove that. And then in the main method, we remove the call to that as well. Okay. So where else do we want to go into update turn um, mode, okay? So we want to do it at the beginning if you're player number two, but we also want to do it every time we click on a button, okay? So after you make your turn, you want to go ahead and wait for your turn to be updated. So inside the setup buttons method, okay, so we go ahead and um, create a thread as well, okay, and update our turn, okay. So we're forgetting to start the threads again. <laughs> so t.start, and then same thing there, okay, t.start, okay? So whenever you click on a button, so you go ahead and send the button number that you have and then you want to go into waiting mode okay so you wait for your turn to be updated uh, and then once you actually receive that okay, calls update turn it gives you the button number that your enemy clicked on which allows you to update enemy points and you set buttons enabled back to true, and then you toggle the button so that you can click on the buttons again. Okay. So, um, right, so I think we can go ahead and test this. Okay. So run the game server, then run the player number one, and run player number two. Okay. 
So let's click on any button on player number one. Okay. So as you can see, in player number two, it says your enemy click button number one. Your turn. So if I click on player number three, and as you can see, player number one says your enemy click button number three. Your turn. Okay. All right. So there. And then if you look at our output window, we're also properly calculating the enemy points. Okay. So now uh, player number two has 117 points. So, uh, so this is um, wait, so this is player number two. Oh, player number two has 74 points. So if you go here to the output window, it should see your enemy has 74 points. So now, yeah, we're properly calculating it. Okay. Okay. So um, up next, let's create a method that allows us to check for who won. So inside the player class. Uh, let's create a method called check winner. So this method can be private, actually. So I don't plan on calling it um, anywhere outside. So private void check winner. Okay. So we check who the winner is at the end of the game. So at this point, we want to disable the button. So buttons enabled is equal to false. Okay. And then you want to check for the winner. Okay. So if my points is greater than enemy points so it means I win so we want to set the text of the message text area message dot set text okay so we just say um, you won and then let's go ahead and put a line break in there okay and then uh, plus okay you and then plus my points plus a line break and then we say plus enemy plus enemy points so what we're doing here is we're just saying that you won and we are displaying the scores okay um, else if my points is less than enemy points typo in there okay so if that's the case then it means you lost so we want to print instead you lost and then let's put in an else clause and then here you just say um, it's a tie And then you both got, and then plus uh, my points, plus points, right? So those are the three possible cases, right? Either you won, or you lost, or you both uh, clicked on the same number of buttons, uh, the same the same button numbers, uh, which gives you the same points. So what do we call check winner now? So if you are player number one. You want to check for the winner inside the update turn method. Okay, so inside the um, update turn method. Okay, so just before we um, toggle the buttons. Okay, so we put in an if statement. If player ID is equal to one and turns main is equal to max turns okay so this means that you're playing number one and then you've already made the maximum number of turns then you want to check for the winner okay and then in the else clause you want to move the buttons enabled is equal to true inside there okay so we go ahead and erase buttons enabled is equal to true outside of the else clause right so what this means is the else clause means that um, as long as the game is still running, then you go ahead and set the buttons back, buttons enabled back to true. Okay? And then here, um, if player ID is equal to 1 and turns made is equal to max turns, then you want to check for the winner for player number 1. Okay? Now for player number 2, you want to check it somewhere else. You want to check it um, inside the action listener um, class. Okay? So here... 
um, what we want to do here is just after we toggle the buttons, or uh, sorry, just, uh, uh, no, um, we can put it, um, actually, we can put it here, okay? So here, we want to say if player ID is equal to 2 and turns made is equal to max turns, then we want to check for the winner, okay? Otherwise, we want to wait for our turn to be updated. So just get this um, whole block with the thread and the thread being started. So we just want to put that inside the else clause. Okay. So why am I checking for the winner in two different uh, places? Okay, so why do we need to check um, differently whether you're player one or your player two? Okay, so keep in mind that it's always player two that makes the last button click, right? Because player one clicks first, so the last turn is always made by player two. So at this point, we want to check um, if player two has actually made the last turn. Okay, so we check for the winner there. We can't check for player ID is equal to one here because player ID, number one, makes the second to the last turn, okay? So player, uh, player number one makes that click, and then player one immediately goes into update turn mode, okay? So at this point, player number one still needs to receive what player two has clicked. So it has to wait what player two has clicked in order for player one to actually properly calculate the points, right? Because we need to update the enemy points with whatever button player number two has clicked. And then, only then, do we want to actually check for the winner, okay? So let's go to the server. And here, um, inside the run method, okay? So inside the while loop, okay. So every time it receives a button number, okay, we want to increment turns made. So turns made plus plus. Okay. And then here we just want to check if turns made is equal to max turns. Then we say uh, system dot out dot print line. Max turns has been reached. <clears throat> and then we want to go ahead and break out of the loop. So when we break out of the loop, um, the run method is going to end and the thread is going to terminate. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, test this now. Okay. So run file. Run player number one, and run player number two. Okay, so all right, let's go ahead and click on any button. One, three, and two, and four. All right, so now we have a winner. So player number two, you won. So player number two has 93 points, and as you can see, it reflects on player number one as enemy, 93 points. So there. So now it's time for us to create the methods that will close the connection. So in the player, class inside the client side connection inner class let's create a method called close connection public void close connection so here uh, let's see uh, we put a try catch again okay. so we just say socket dot close then let's put out a uh, print line system dot out dot print line Just, let's just say connection closed. And then uh, the uh, catch clause. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, 
Okay, and then we want to call this one um, when we check for the winner. So inside the check winner method, at the end of it, okay, we put um, csc dot close connection. So that closes the connection on the player side. Uh, so on the game server side, okay. So let's go back to the game server now. And so in the game server, um, after we break, so outside of the while loop. Um, that's when we want to close. But um, let's go ahead and create a close connection method for the um, server as well. Okay. Uh, so this one is um, going to be, yeah, let's just call it close connection also. So try socket.close. System.out.print9 uh, connection closed and then uh, catch and then system.out.print9 SSC SSC, right? Server side connection. Uh, so when do we want to uh, call this? Okay. So um, after we break out of the while loop. Okay. So after we break out of the while loop. Right. So we want to call uh, player one dot close connection, and then player two dot close connection. Okay. So um, turns made becomes equal to max turns once player two has actually finished the final turn. So this is actually gonna call, uh, gonna get uh, executed once player two does the final turn, okay? And then after that, we break out of the while loop, and then we make sure that we go ahead and close um, both connections, player one and player two, because at this point, our game has ended and uh, there's no use keeping the connections open. All right, so let's go ahead and test this now. buttons. All right, so uh, let's check uh, the output window for player number one. So connection closed, output window for connection three, connection closed as well. For the turn-based game though, we have uh, we have one IO exception, okay? So um, we have an IO exception that gets thrown at the end of the game when we close the connections. So it doesn't really matter as much because at this point our um, game has finished. But I'll leave this to you guys as an optional exercise so you can try and figure out why this happens and also um, how to fix it. So also um, another optional exercise maybe. Um, so try and figure out how to do this. Uh, so when we run the game server, and then we uh, run the file for player one, player one's buttons are immediately enabled, right? So that's what we made it do. But as an optional exercise, make it so that when player one runs, the buttons are disabled and they'll only become enabled immediately after player number two runs. Okay, all right. So there, thank you for watching and <laughs> I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> all right, bye. Take my gap. Bye.